Gail is Professor of History at California State University, Fullerton. Her first book was on merchants in 16th century Rouen, but her current work focuses on the 20th century. She recently co-authored Murder on the Metro with Annette, and, is, and they are both working on two new projects, which we'll hear a little more about today. Gail is presenting Collaborating to Kill, Vichy and the Mouvement Social et Revolutionnaire in the Assassination of Marx Dormois. Thank you. And here we have our image of the ligne de demarcation. The second armistice of Compagnie divided France into multiple zones, the two largest of which were delineated by what became known as the line of demarcation. This separation, which went into effect on June 25, 1940, disrupted the geographic unity of the French state and created two very different environments, a larger one under German control and a lesser free zo zone ruled from Vichy. The Germans very quickly sealed the frontier. Passage between the two zones required a special German permit that for most French citizens was extremely difficult to obtain. After Pierre Laval's ejection from Maréchal Pétain's cabinet on December 13, 1940, even Vichy government officials, police, and civil servants were prohibited from crossing the line, and offenders were threatened with arrest or even death. The line of demarcation was meant to asphyxiate France economically and militarily while ensuring that the greater part of the country's population and resources were under direct German military authority. Few scholarly studies have been devoted to the line of demarcation, most narratives of the line assume that the majority of people who did traverse it were either resistance heroes fighting to liberate France or refugees fleeing to the Vichy zone to escape German oppression. There's much less material, although some, about everyday passage of the line. This paper explores the line of demarcation in a different way. Our work concerns the wartime network linking France's extreme right organizations operating in Paris and the Vichy zone. Many of the people in these groups had belonged to the Comité Secret d'Action Révolutionnaire, or the Cagoule, prior to the war. In the course of our research, we discovered that these men and women maintained their contacts with each other and managed, often with the collusion of officials at Vichy and Paris, to cross the line of demarcation with relative ease in order to continue their subversive and terrorist activities to further their goal of instituting the National Revolution. Their network comprised a topography of collaboration and of violence that transcended the line and encompassed both the occupied and unoccupied zones. And by the way, this was well after their supposed leaders of the Kagul had supposedly parted ways, one going to Paris, one remaining at Vichy. We take as a case study the murder of Socialist Senator Marc Stormois on July 25, 1941, and consider the geospatial dynamic that allowed persons in Vichy and Paris to collaborate in bringing about this man's assassination and covering up the crime afterward. Our study highlights that although the demarcation line in many ways maintained an economic and political stranglehold on France, it was a porous frontier indeed for those whose passage across it furthered the aims of powerful individuals in Vichy and Paris. During the evening of July 25, 1941, three men and one woman planted a time bomb beneath the mattress of Marc Sormois, former French interior minister under Léon Blum's popular French government. It's a wonderful story how that bomb got there. Dormois was living in the city of Montélimar at the time at the Hotel Le Relais de l'Empereur where Pétain's government had placed him under a form of house arrest. Dormois was among a group of prominent politicians of the Third Republic, including Dormois' friend and mentor Léon Blum, as well as Georges Mandel, Vincent Auriol, and Paul Reynaud, whom the Vichy regime had ordered incarcerated and held for possible trial in August and September of 1940. By the summer of 1941, all but a handful had been released or placed in forced residence. The rest, among, the, among them Blum, were awaiting trial at Rion. 
The bomb at Montalimar went off just before 2 a.m. and nearly decapitated Dormois, killing him instantly. The members of the police mobile of Montalimar, Lyon, and Marseille, the juge d'instruction at Montalimar, and the famous commissaire Charles Chenevier of the Deuxième Bureau, working at Vichy at the time of the assassination, did a remarkably thorough job of investigating the crime and tracking down the assassins, despite the reticence of the authorities at Vichy to dig too deeply into the case. The police arrested three of the young assassins, all of them under, tw under 30, Yves Moignet, Ludovic Guichard, and Annie Moraille, as well as Roger Moraille and Corsican soldier Antoine Marquis, both implicated in plotting the assassination and abetting the assassins. For nearly two years, they languished in prison, first at the Maison d'Arret at de Valence and then at L'Argentière, both in the Ardèche. In January of 1943, shortly after the German invasion of the Vichy zone, Hugo Geisler, head of the Gestapo in Vichy, showed up at L'Argentière with a large contingent of soldiers, forced the warden to liberate the prisoners, threatening to blow the prison up if he did not, and drove off with Ani Morai sitting next to him in his limousine. This story alone is fascinating, but what Chenevier uncovered regarding the origins of the crime is even more so. It will come as no surprise that many on the right in France despised Marc Stormois and viewed his assassination as, to a quote, assassin Roger Moraille, just one less jerk in the world. Dormois was a passionate defender of socialism and of the Jews in 1930s France. One of the 80 le legislators who voted against giving Pétain full power on July 10, 1940, and a faithful friend and supporter of the doubly despised socialist and Jew, Léon Blum. But Dormois was also the principal figure behind the 1937-38 investigation that led to the dismantling of the Cagoule. The creation of former naval engineer Eugène Deloncle, the goal of the Cagoule was the overthrow of the Popular Front and ultimately of the Third Republic. Dormois at least temporarily crushed those dreams when, in late 1937, he dismantled the Cagoule and arrested some of its leaders, including Deloncle. Although by 1938 most of the members of the Cagoule were either in prison or in hiding in France, Franco, Spain, or Italy, the coming of the war derailed government plans to put them on trial. Upon the outbreak of the war, pressure to maintain national unity in the face of foreign invasion obliged the government to release all of the Cagoulard, even Eugène de l'Oncle. Others returned to France from their self-imposed exile, and most took an active part in the war effort. The end of the Third Republic brought, at least temporarily, a halt to any effort to try them for their terrorist activities, which had resulted in the deaths of at least five people and much destruction of property before the war. But it is important to remember, and this is key, that these cases were by no means dismissed, but rather were only suspended, and the Cagoulard themselves were well aware of this. An order from Pétain could lead to the trial's resumption at any time, which meant that the Cagoule affair remained a threat to these former Cagoulard, whether they were serving in the Vichy government, members of the resistance, or in Paris collaborating with the Germans. An inconvenient Cagoulard could be thrown back in prison or tried. Many former Cagoulard or Cagoule sympathizers, such as Javier Vallat, François Metenier, Raphael Alibert, and Gabriel Jante were either members of the Vichy government or maintained close ties to it. Pétain's national revolution seemed to them the fulfillment of the Cagoule's goals, while their strong nationalist and anti-German sentiments rendered collaboration an unappealing path for them. Chenevier was able to find strong evidence tracing the origins of Dormois' assassination to the highest ranks of bureaucrats in Pétain's government, and especially to Gabriel Jante, former gunrunner for the Cagoule, who founded the pro-Vichy propaganda organization, the Ami Corps de France, and was personally close to Pétain, although at the time of Dormois' assassination, Jante was technically outside the government. Other former Cagoulard, such as Eugène Deloncle, Jean Filiol, Jacques Correz, and Joseph Darnon, headed to Paris and chose the route of collaboration. Dormois' assassins, with the support of their mentors in Vichy, crossed the line of demarcation and found funding and logistical support among the Parisian collaborationists. 
Most notably, Delancle, who founded in Paris a successor to the Cagoule, the Mouvement Social Revolutionnaire pour la Révolution Nationale, funneled money and logistical support to the assassins before and after the crime. Delancle and his former lieutenant in the Cagoule, Gabriel Jante, both insisted that they had broken with each other once Delancle renounced Vichy and headed to Paris to find new pat patrons in the Gestapo in the fall of 1940. Like Pétain and Laval, Jante and Delancle were supposedly at each other's throats by the end of 1940. Yet again, like Pétain and Laval, they seem to have maintained contact with each other, at least indirectly, through various intermediaries. And despite their differences, there is substantial evidence that Jante and Delancle also cooperated to bring about Dormois' assassination and, as far as they were able, to cover the tracks of the assassins after the crime. The most likely motivation for this collaboration was not ideological, however. Unlike the young assassins, what most probably brought Jante and Delancle to bridge their differences sufficiently to organize the assassination and target Dormois was less their hatred of his politics and more their anger at his successful campaign against the Cagoule and, especially, fear of what he might reveal about the Cagoule and who had secretly supported it should he ever be put on trial. Because, among other things, remember, as Annette said, he brought the papers with him, over a hundred of them, just about the Cagoule, to Montelimar and put him in his hotel room. Even though the drama of the assassination clearly originated in Pétain's close circle at Vichy, it was Prime Minister, as Vice President of the Council, Pierre Laval, who during one of his visits to Paris to consult with the Germans and the Parisian collaborationists, brought about the end of the drama by arranging for the liberation of the assassins. Laval's role here is not as surprising as it might seem. In December of 1940, a faction within the Vichy regime that included Gabriel Jante and his mentor, Dr. Menetral, persuaded Pétain to dismiss Laval. A former member of the Cagoule, François Metenier, acting on the orders of Colonel Groussard, a Cagoulard sympathizer and head of Pétain's group de protection, arrested Laval. Within a day, Otto Abetz, German ambassador to France, personally drove to Vichy with a contingent of German soldiers, freed Laval, and brought him back to Paris, since Pétain refused to reinstate Laval. Ostensibly, it would seem that Laval would have had little reason, therefore, to help out assassins in the employ of Vichy. Once in Paris, Laval immediately set about coordinating with the various extreme right pro-collaborationist groups operating in the capital, including Jacques Doriot's Parti Populaire Francais, Marcel Deat's Rassemblement National et Populaire, et de and Delancle's MSR, attempting to fold them into a single organization. Although the, the effort was not particularly successful, it meant that Laval did have reason want to, to want to cultivate Delancle in 1941, if only to rein in the, uh, thank you, Bert Gordon here, condottieri of the collaboration, and bring them under the aegis of a centralized French fascist party under Laval's control. Such a feat would have greatly enhanced Laval's credit with the Germans and bargaining power with Pétain. Moreover, Laval's relationship with Delancle may well have predated the war, as Marc Stormois himself suggested in a letter he wrote from prison to Laval in January of 1941. In that letter, in which Dormois requested Laval's help in obtaining his release, Dormois alluded to evidence he had obtained and suppressed at Laval's behest, and probably had in his hotel room, um, it, it, um, evidence from 1937-1938 that indicated that Laval had been involved in the activities of the Cagoule. Thus, Laval had reasons of his own to want Dormois eliminated and to collude with Jante and or Delancle in removing Dormois and covering up the crime. All the participants in the murder of Marx Dormois circulated among and received funds and assistance before, during, and after the war from supporters of the Cagoule MSR in both France and Spain, where Roger Morail, like many of the Cagoulard, had fought for Franco. They also moved with remarkable ease between Paris and, v and the Vichy zone, finding funds and aids on both sides in Vichy and Paris. The assassins were able to draw on reservoirs of support in vo both Vichy and Paris because former members of the French extreme right prior to the war quietly maintained 
close, albeit informal, ties among themselves during the war, ties that span the line of demarcation. These bonds were significant because they greased the wheels of collaboration between Paris and Vichy, including facilitating such unsavory adventures as the assassination of Marc Stormois, while discreetly veiling the extent of that collaboration, and thus allowing Pétain and those close to him to insist, at least until 1943, on his government's independence from the occupiers. Pétain could keep his hands clean, while Laval and the collaborationists in Paris shouldered the opprobrium for doing the Germans' dirty work. This is not to deny that very real differences separated many who joined Pétain's government in Vichy and remained loyal to the Maréchal until the end, such as Jean Tay, from those who embraced, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, collaboration with the Germans, such as Deloncle. Those differences in ideology and outlook, while creating friction, did not preclude former comrades from before the war from working together during the war when the goal, such as eliminating a hated mutual enemy, seemed to warrant such cooperation any more than mutual disdain between Pétain and Laval absolutely precluded them from cooperating. This is why, in the end, it was the Germans who freed Dormois' assassins from their prison at L'Argentière in the Vichy zone at the behest of Pierre Laval. Vichy could not free them on their own because the murder had alarmed and disgusted too many people in France and abroad. But the assassins also knew too much. They were ready to name names. And as they themselves repeatedly insisted after their arrest, now that they had performed the patriotic task the Maréchal's National Revolution required, at the behest of the Maréchal, the Maréchal was determined to make them disappear while in prison, so no one would ever know the truth about Dormois' execution. The assassins spoke often of Pétain, whom they considered their true leader in the assassination, and to whom they addressed many appeals for help while in prison. Still, there is strong evidence suggesting that Laval had much more to fear from Dormois than did Pétain, and that therefore Vichy Justice Minister Joseph Barthélemy was thus like, likely telling the truth when he said that it was a phone call from Laval that prodded the Germans to free the assassins and get them safely to Paris. It was vital to both Laval and Pétain that the national revolution appeared to be as national as possible, and that they, especially Pétain, be portrayed as pro protecting the French from German domination, rather than collaborating with the Germans to repress the French. Hence the utility to both men of someone like Deloncle, who would not shrink from any sort of skullduggery or thuggish violence to advance the national revolution or his own career, especially if it might in enhance his own influence among the extreme right in Paris as well. But the necessity of keeping Deloncle and his Parisian collaborators with their dark plots and violent tendencies entrenched in Paris and safely at arm's length from Vichy meant that it was necessary to use intermediaries. Who better than their former Cagoulard comrade in arms at Vichy, men such as Gabriel Jante? Both Deloncle and Jante denied any involvement in Dormois' assassination and maintained that they had not been in contact since they parted ways in autumn of 1940. Substantial evidence indicates that both men were lying and that the crime was and necessarily had to be, given the logistics of how it was planned, financed, and carried out and covered up, a joint operation between Vichy and Paris. Evidence for this can be discerned through a close examination of both the perpetrators and logistics of the crime. Here I have time only to resume very briefly that evidence which can be found in the voluminous dossier of witness testimony and other materials the police collected during their investigation of Dormois' murder, the Parisian police archives, and also in the papers of Dormois' sister, Jean Dormois, in the Archive Départemental d'Allier, papers that have only recently been made public, as in within a couple of years. The police spoke to at least 100 witnesses, and although the accused assassins were all in prison by the autumn of 1941, the investigation continued right up until the release in January of 1943. Upon his return from a German concentration camp where he had been sent for his resistance activities, Charles Chenevier continued to maintain that Deloncle and Jante had collaborated to arrange the assassination of Marc Stormois. In 1946, Chenevier testified to that effect before Judge Robert Levy, who had been given the task of reopening the Dormois case. Chenevier knew that Deloncle had to have played a role, not only because Chenevier's sources within 
the uh, Delunclas MSR had told him this and given him very accurate inside information about the crime before it was committed as well as afterward, but also because witnesses in Montelimar had a correctly identified Andre Erard, who was highly placed in the, in the MSR and worked for Delonkla. They could not have done so had Erard not been in Montelimar in the company of the assassins shortly before the crime. By the same token, Chenevier knew that the ties to Vichy were too clear to be ignored either. Ani Marai not only claimed that Jante was involved, but identified Jante from a photo. Yves Moignier and Roger, Roger Morai also insisted upon Vichy's involvement, and Ludovic Guichard's wife expected, and wrote a letter to, Gabriel Jante to get her husband out of prison. Antoine Marquis went first to Vichy for money and assistance, and only subsequently to Paris to Deloncle for help after the crime. Finally, Annie Marai was in possession of a false passport that only the Vichy government could have issued her and that permitted her to cross back and forth across the line of demarcation. The crime, therefore, had to have been organized in both Vichy and Paris and coordinated by the same men, Gabriel Jante and Eugène Deloncle, who had collaborated in the 1930s in the Cagoule. As Philippe Bourdrell put it, bad habits die hard. To conclude, all of this suggests that we need to be very wary when we assess the reality of the relationships between the members of the Vichy regime and the collaborationists in Paris. There may have been no love lost between Pétain and Laval, as was true for many of their followers, including Jean Tay and Deloncle. But that does not mean that these people could not and did not maintain many avenues of contact and work together when it seemed to be their advantage. The assassins possessed the money and the official documents that allowed them to remove, move remarkably smoothly around France and traverse the line of demarcation as often as they needed in order to accomplish the assassination of Marc Stormois. They could not have done this without complicity from both sides, arranged in a manner to allow deniability for the most highly placed conspirators. Fortunately for them, these conspirators meaning fortunately for the conspirators, these conspirators possess networks of experienced and ruthless underlings already in place because these networks had existed prior to the war. All that was needed, therefore, was to mobilize these foot soldiers and provide them with the resources to carry out the crime. Thank you.